Today, I think uh, the reason for this, I'm quite sure Sikkim has organized, is because of uh, Nick Clegg, uh, the Lib Dem re leader and the um, Deputy Prime Minister, his comments uh, to The Guardian um, that um, the rich should pay an extra tax called wealth tax, which he's going to um, expand during the Lib Dem conference. Um, and it should be, this is beyond the existing proposals by the Lib Dems uh, uh, for a mention tax. Um, the debate is, uh, the topic of the debate uh, for today is this house would levy a wealth tax. And for the motion, uh, Chris. Uh, Chris Membery is uh, a political activist and a commentator and leading member of the International Socialist Group in Scotland. He was uh, previously a member of the Central Committee of the British Socialist Workers' Party until April uh, 2011 when he resigned from the party. He doesn't say why. Um, Adrian Thurston is the director of the political think tank, the Lyceum. During this period, he has performed various research activities including evolutionary citizenship and strategic problems in accommodating individual rights. He has presented at various conferences and workshops including the English Democrats annual conference in 2009. He's also appeared as a guest and commentator on Press TV, IRIB, and INN. He is currently working on a response to the Institute for Public Policy Research paper, Is There an English Nationalism by Professor Richard English. Uh, each speaker will get five to seven minutes, and then uh, after that, uh, they'll get three minutes to rebut uh, each other, and then uh, we'll put it to the uh, floor. So if I can ask Chris to um, uh, debate for the, uh, well, present it for the, um, that this house would levy a wealth tax. Over the, assalamu alaikum, over the last three decades, we have been fed a series of lies which have become the mainstay of economic and social policy around the world. Those series of lies center on the idea that privatization, deregulation, and reducing tax on the rich will lead to an economic boom. I want to argue tonight, starting with this, that far from producing better days for us all, what we've seen over the last 30 years is a growth globally and in this country of inequality and a shifting of wealth from the poor to the rich. And I say this has happened in Britain, but also we know that uh, many of these policies were pioneered in the global south over the last three decades by the International Monetary Fund, from Pakistan to Paraguay, implementing often destructive structural adjustment programs which have left devastation behind in the wake. But uh, if you want to look at what I'm trying uh, try, uh, try to say more is, let's look at London in 2000, uh, 2012. Despite the economic recession, which has now gone on for some five years, there is an explosion of wealth still at the top of society in London. We are currently experiencing a property boom, which is centered on the very wealthiest houses in London, Mayfair, Kensington, Knightsbridge. Houses which even someone like David Cameron, who's a multimillionaire, could not afford, because essentially those people have been bought by the global super rich. We are continuing to see in the city of London bonuses being paid, people getting their salary, op uh, salary sh uh, share options, golden pensions, despite the fact these people were the very people, the bankers and the uh, speculators who brought us this financial crash and speculation. And is it the case that in London over the last three decades, for those who remember, things have got better for the greater population? The simple truth is, actually, the growth of what's called the service sector has led to an increase in low-paid jobs, an increase in poverty, in, ch uh, in ch children's poverty, for example, overcrowding in homes, and other problems which I'm sure many people here are aware of. If you were to step back, and for those of memories, is London, or indeed Britain, a fairer and better society today than it was in the 1970s? It's an unfashionable thing to say, but I would argue, actually, it's a uh, the 1970s were fairer and actually there was less poverty than there are today as a result of three decades of policies which I've tried to explain but implemented by Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair, and, uh, and, uh, and the like. We have reached a situation we now have, as I say, a property boom, which is driven by tax exiles from Europe, the Middle East, elsewhere, who are investing in this country, buying up property at the most expensive end of the market, 
who do not pay any tax in this country. The Roman Abramovich's and the other people of, the, uh, of, that, uh, of that ilk. You know, we're talking about a world where really I don't think anyone here has got an inkling of uh, in terms of the, the opulence and the prosperity of it. And yet at the other end, it's revealed today that Save the Children, for the first time in its existence, will be implementing a program in Britain to do, uh, provide hot meals for families who cannot, uh, cannot afford uh, three meals a day. We have a situation where many families, it was reported in BBC Newsnight this week, rely on food banks, food handouts raised by charity, again in order to feed children. And when I talk about child poverty and these things, it's worth saying, a majority of the parents who are affected, uh, families affected by child poverty are in work. They are in jobs which do not pay enough to feed them. Right? And we live in a low-wage economy. Britain is one of the low-wage economies of, West, uh, of, we uh, of Western Europe, among with other social problems which I haven't got time to come into, but it's clear that things are not working. David Cameron talks about Britain being broken. I have to say, if it's broken, it was Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair who broke it, and I think Cameron should take responsibility uh, for that. And tax is a major issue here. The main civil service trade union estimates and well-researched figures that some £120 billion is missing in tax evasion and tax fraud. This is not by people like you and me failing to fill, uh, fill in our tax returns. This is by at the very top of society, right? people not paying their tax. And yet George Osborne is sacking tax collectors at the moment. So there's going to be less money, uh, money collected in. £120 billion in tax evasion and tax fraud, which has gone missing, would pay off most of the deficit, which George Osborne is, uh, is concerned about, and relieve us the task of having to uh, uh, accept the burden of cuts in public spending, increases in VAT, and so on. And we also live in a society where it's worth saying that income tax and corporation tax are lower today, lower than they were under Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. Simply restoring income tax levels and corporation tax levels to where they were under Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s would go a long way to, again, to paying off that deficit, which, in fact, we, uh, we, are, uh, we, are, uh, we are paying in ter uh, ter uh, terms of that. And yet, the, even the most modest current suggestions, which I have to say I take with a pinch of salt from Nick Clegg and others about uh, uh, tax, uh, taxing the rich, I think it's more about arguments with inside their own parties, this proposal comes just before the Liberal Democrats' annual conference, so it's a good time for Nick Clegg to be trying to distance himself from his Conservative partners in co uh, co uh, co uh, co uh, coalition. Uh, I think brings on howls about what's going on. When I say it's not enough, I would argue, go further if we have time tonight to discuss it, that I would be in favour of introducing a wealth tax taxing the rich, but I think that has to be combined with a drive to reduce inequality, to, re uh, to eliminate poverty in this country, and I think it also has to centre on creating jobs, real jobs, which create real value, which make things. Not jobs in the city of London, not jobs in speculation, but jobs where people can have some pride in terms of that. One minute. Uh, two objections. Firstly, all the rich would leave, okay? If they want to leave because they're going to pay more tax, my answer would be bye-bye. Actually, their wealth is based in this country by and large, so why are they going to leave? The rich are coming to this country, as I pointed out. Secondly, the other argument is we can't buck the, uh, buck the market. Well, actually, where has the market got us to after three decades of unregulated capital? We're in the biggest mess since the, 19, uh, the uh, 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 1930s in uh, uh, terms of that. And the simple answer to try and conclude on is, is that privatization, deregulation, tax cuts, this whole policy of the last three decades has ended up not just shifting wealth from rich to poor, but creating this mess. We live in a society which glorifies financial speculation, glorifies usury. There is something morally wrong with that. And the idea that people should not, the rich should pay less tax, I would argue is morally wrong as well. We should be based in a society which looks after those people who are in, in trouble. And there is, again, as I say, and I'll conclude in that, this is not some argument to look after people who are just feckless, all arrested, although people who currently can't find jobs should be looked after. But it is scandalous that people who have worked all their lives are suffering the lowest pensions in Western Europe, that there will be pensioners dying this winter because they cannot afford fuel bills, 
as I say, families are going hungry because they can't afford to feed, uh, feed their children. These are people who are, have worked or are in work. It is ridiculous that we should be burdening our children when they leave college with having to pay off their fees, having to pay off a student grant, with having to pay extra for a pension fund, uh, pensions, which is now being, uh, being asked of them, having to pay much more for housing. I mean, they'll never be able to afford to buy a house in the current state, uh, state of affairs. What are we leaving behind for our future generations here? And I think there is something wrong with society. And in a sense, this is a moral question, and it's a question of democracy. And I'll just conclude at this point, is it right that a tiny minority of the super rich can get away with essentially blackmailing the rest of society by saying things like, if you dare increase taxes, we will leave the country? Why should we have to pay for an economic crisis we did not cause? Why? And they caused it. It was the bankers and the speculators caused this. My fundamental argument in favor of a wealth tax and much more would be they should pay. Well, first of all, the, um, uh, the, the wealth tax that's being proposed by uh, Nick Clegg and the Liberal Democrats Party um, is something which I think that all reasonable people would imagine is the right and proper thing to do to protect the social fabric of society and to protect us all from uh, criminals, because uh, obviously we need police officers and therefore you need to increase revenues to pay for police officers. But the, the overriding question that needs to be asked here is what kind of society we should be living in. Um, the Conservative Party are under the impression that uh, by uh, inputting money into the economy it encourages other people to spend money. That's to say, if you give a lot of money to a lot of rich people, they'll spend money in the economy, which creates a, a desire for more money, because if money's being put into the economy and it, people are uh, buying large products, then they're selling their old products secondhand, and then money's being circulated and generated in that way. I'm not talking about cars as people are probably thinking, as I am. But you know, large plant machinery and you know, large industrial goods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this comes from the 1930s in the United States of America, when they discovered that if you, if you spend an awful lot of money on one big project, it kickstarts the economy. And that principle has been at play worldwide since the 1930s in the United States of America. It's called monetarism. And since that time, monetarism has played a major part in restarting and re-kicking all economies everywhere every time there's a dip in the economy. But this time, it doesn't appear to be working in the way that uh, the, uh, the monetarists would have thought. In my opinion, it's probably because of corruption in the system, but uh, it's probably because banks and other institutions of that like have been loaning money out at large interests to people that just can't afford it. And many, many people have defaulted on their loans, creating a big black spot in the banking economy. Um, and now, the question of broken Britain that uh, has been raised, if one thinks that you're going to fix Britain by throwing money at the problem, i.e. raising tax revenue and then spending it on the working class and spending it on the poor, um, what tends to happen there is that it, it, it solves the problem for a while, but the economy then tends to become bankrupt because all the money is being spent on the poor and rich people get poorer and the poor people don't invest money because they don't have money to invest. So money just vanishes. The question is, how is it possible in the 21st century to recover a double-dipped, bankrupt economy such as the British economy, such as many world economies? even the American economy. Well, let's go back to the 1930s and the recession that 
almost obliterated the United States of America. Finally, I mean, they were considering uh, splitting America up into the North and South because there was no money. Everyone was starving to death. Um, the president risked everything by investing all the money that the United States had in building the, the Hoover Dam. That worked. What we can do in Britain is to use whatever money that we have to invest in industries, in service industries, in manufacturing, uh, in creating product. But where does the money come from? If you have no money in your economy, you rely on investments from overseas. You rely on investments from rich people in your own country to invest in these industries uh, and in these businesses. You rely on people with money to put money into your economy, into your banks, so that the banks can loan money out to people wanting to start businesses and uh, invest in already expanding businesses. So therefore, if you want to take money away from those people uh, in order to pay for poor people, uh, you're not going to have money to invest in an expanding economy because we need to expand. We need money to invest and we need money to have in reserve in case we need it for some emergency, such as a war, for instance. Um, the point that David Cameron and many conservatives have made, such as uh, Mr. Jenkins, who's an M uh, uh, a backbench MP, are that if you take money away from people who are in this country only to make money, those people will leave your country and invest in another country that is easier on them, that will allow them to make more money. So, um, I've made a note here of a number of issues that uh, have been brought up about uh, charities helping the poor and what Mrs. Thatcher and the Conservatives of the 1970s and 80s did to destroy Britain. Um, the question of whether or not we have a fairer society nowadays um, is a moot point because for some people it is fairer, but of course for most people it isn't fair because they're poor. So what you could say is that Britain today is not a poor society. It is designed for rich people. It's primarily designed for the super rich. And the money that the super rich bring to this country is invested in the infrastructure of this country. And David Cameron and the Conservatives do not want those people to leave. And so they are not in favour of a a uh, tax on wealth or a tax on houses over two million pounds and they're not in favor of a per capita wealth tax either. So um, I think that I've rounded off what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, okay. cool. uh, just, just in response, I think we, I have to say, uh, we, have give, we have given billions to some of the richest people in Britain over the last few years. We gave some nearly 200 billion to the bankers to bail out the banks. We actually nationalized the debts of those banks when they went bankrupt, but then gave money to the very people. We have been given money in a thing called quantitative easing, which is a, very, it's a funny term, but it essentially means the Bank of England has been giving money in order to get the economy moving. Major corporations and banks have taken this money, and they are not investing it. They're literally sticking under their bed because they don't think there's any return on investing it during an economic recession. So we've been giving money to people who have not been doing anything with it. Why do uh, people invest? If you are, and if you were thinking seriously of investing a few billion pounds, anyone here, do you invest in a country because of the tax you individually are going to pay? Or do you invest because of the productivity of the workforce how much and how quickly they're going to produce things. You know, the profit you're going to make in that in terms of a company, they're the things which define this. Tax rates in Germany are higher than in Britain. If you were an industrialist, which country would you think about investing in? 
I would argue that Germany would be the country you'd think about more because it's got a, a very skilled workforce, which you may have to pay higher wages, but actually they produce more. They make much more wealth quicker for you because they've been trained. They have, as I mentioned, they have apprentices. And the final point, just in this brief response, I think when I say it's a fairer society, I think we have to say is that many of the ideas I've talked about are based on an economic, social, and political model, which is the United States of America. If there is any society which I know, which I would not hold up as a model, which does not work, it is the United States of America. Given the extremes of wealth and poverty there, given the problems the United States has itself, how it treats its own people, why is Britain tailing along behind the United States? And of course, there is another consequence of that, is that Britain has tailed along behind the United States in other ways as well. There is always money for wars and occupation. There is never money for welfare. And currently we are seeing Britain tailing along the United States as America, with Israel alongside it, is preparing for another military adventure, this time in terms of an attack in Iran. You know, these things go together. There is a consequence of an economic policy. It's reflected in political policy. And that kind of Reaganite, Thatcherite policies of the 1980s has fed into this alliance, which has held all the way through. And it's brought enormous consequences for British lives and for British society. And I'd argue the United States is not a model we should be following in any respect. Uh, Chris, I think that uh, you're forgetting one thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the model that the United States produced the monetarist model that I mentioned earlier uh, is still, still true today as it was in the 1930s. And most major economies in the world use the same model. But the question is, where does the money come from? In the United States, it came from uh, the, uh, backup resources, uh, and it worked. In other countries, uh, they get their money from either the IMF or in Europe from the ECB, um, and in other countries from the World Bank. And these people that invest in this country also invest in all these banks all over the world. They're the super rich, as you called them. And so it's really important not to upset these people because if they pull the money out of your economy, where are you going to get the money to pay your unemployment benefits? Where are you going to get the money to pay for your civil servants and your public sector workers? How are you going to invest in industry? Where's the bank's going to get its money from? If I can respond, Adrian, I think if you look around the world, if you get money from the International Monetary Fund, you pay a very high price for that money indeed socially. You do. And I think we're seeing now that's happened acro across countries, as I said, from Pakistan to Paraguay. We're now seeing it happen happening in countries like Greece and Spain here in Europe. The strings which are attached to money from the International Monetary Fund are very severe indeed and do immense damage to the economy. Um, we'll uh, put now uh, questions from the floor. I think it's an interesting debate. Uh, just to start with a quick response to where did the U.S. gets its money. At the moment, the U.S. owes trillions of dollars to China, basically. So it's not from backup resources. It's from borrowing. It's just because of the reserve currency status of the dollar, they could borrow, and they haven't had to go to the IMF. If the U.S. goes to the IMF... Sorry, what was your name? Iqbal. Iqbal. The IMF would just yeah. clean them out and tell them to get their house in order. So well, that's nowadays, nowadays, money isn't what you think it is. I know it's, it's just, just printed. It's just a series of IOUs. And the United States also got its money in 1971 by delinking gold from the dollar. And so they had one round of, if you like, debt forgiveness by force. Yes, and they are looking for another round now because, again, they cannot afford to pay back what they have borrowed, right? So it's... And it is not a model. If in a 300 million people, 50 million people have no backup, no social safety net, no medical aid, this is not in a society which we want to emulate. Yes, but it's one of the biggest markets in the world for people to sell in, and that's why it's so important. It is important, but it is not something to emulate. Uh, we, and in, the, in Britain, are faced between the two sides. Either look at the European model, which has a slightly longer-term horizon, especially Germany, Scandinavia, and so on. Well, the commercial economy is and what the world aims at. Yeah, okay. And achieving growth rates, which are not really that different from the United States. So I don't know why we are always trying to, you know, piggy bank on the United States. That's one. 
But the more important thing for Britain, Britain is not a resource-led economy. It's not the United States, it's not France, it's not Germany. Britain has got very few natural resources, if you like, right? It is an economy which has to survive on its own skills, knowledge, production, and so on. And up to recently, it did quite well. The amount of foreign direct investment into Britain was quite <coughs> high. Recently, it's begun to taper off. But in the process of the last 20 years, what has happened in Britain specifically, if you look at the share of gross profits going to labor and going to capital, yeah, absolutely. that share has shifted drastically the other way. The share going to capital has increased. And therefore, there is no demand in the economy because these people who are getting million, trillion pound bonuses, they are not going to spend that. That is the problem of the UK, how to redress that balance. Now, you can't do that if you go and outsource things to people like G4S who clean you out, people like Three Cross, people like these uh, rail companies. You look at this contract which has been given now, the Virgin contract has been given back to, what is the other company? First, Great Western. Great, no, no, uh, they were doing great, first but first Western. something yeah. which had the Great Western. This is typically risk shifting. That contract allows you to bid for a very high price, front load profits for yourself, and then midway say, I don't want the thing, which is exactly this same company has done that on the Great Western, and they are going to do it uh, on the Great Eastern side, and they're going to do it here. And company after company, this outsourcing is a scandal because they don't take the risk, just like the banks. They monopolize the profits and socialize the losses onto us. Look at the TFL contracts, yeah? which were forced on Can Ken Livingston. Just one second, Ken Livingston. They were, he was forced to take the partnership of the private contractors for TFL. At the end of the day, they just left. They said, we cannot afford this two billion gap and we leave it to the public sector and we have to pick up the bill we can, because we cannot shut down the underground. Okay, so what do you want to ex exactly to ask him? So I'm saying that rent seeking has become primary rather than production. We have to shift the balance back if you want to make this country work. No, no, just want to his comment. Um, I don't really know. I mean, <laughs> I think one of, one of the things that I'd like to say is that um, one of the problems that this country has when it has uh, uh, a very large uncollected tax bill from corporates and from uh, private individuals is that sometimes uh, for example, with Vodafone, um, they have shifted their major operations to Switzerland, uh, but they still have a very, very large operation in the UK, and they owe the, 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 the British uh, inland revenue up to about a billion pounds, if not more. But the, the inland revenue are unable to collect on it because Vodafone have been very clear in saying, if you try to collect on us, we will close down our operations and start a new one. So what would happen is that hundreds of thousands of people would be put out of work and Vodafone would start a new company, uh, very small to begin with, and they would grow and they would repeat what they've done already. But in the meantime, uh, there would be fantastic disruption, a massive unemployment uh, uh, disaster and Vodafone are playing a very dangerous game with the British taxpayer because they're call, trying to call the bluff of the British government. And they have called the bluff. And Vodafone is still trading. They still owe a massive amount of money in tax. And they're not going to pay. So isn't that a bit... Uh, well, against your argument uh, in the sense I'm that a, they don't want to pay the tax... No, because, because what we want to do is we want to keep the jobs. We don't want to disrupt people. So therefore, we have to, to, to pay their, their, their demands. There isn't anything else Just on do. Vodafone. On Vodafone, you see, despite this, our prime minister is going to India and lobbying that government to forgive Vodafone $2.3 billion of tax there. Which brings me to the <laughs> original point that I made of the corruption. So what, what can you do? If you have to pay corrupt 
backhanders to big companies so that they don't leave your... Uh, um, so they don't leave completely, um, you have to do something else. But I, I think one of the biggest myths we've had always is these corporations, multinational corporations, will just simply uproot up and go. Actually, if you look at it, despite much of the talk, and even despite the rise of China, the, the dominance of major multinational corporations is still based in the United States and Western Europe, Japan, and Canada. And the research and development is there. Maybe the production's not there, but the research and development is there, which is the key bit, right, in terms of it. To uproot that would be a huge, huge thing. And it would take many years of planning and all that. They can't just simply up uproot it. Of course, you know, you can uproot a factory which just assembles a, a mobile phone. But you're talking about the infrastructure of the whole multi They can't just do that. And at some stage, we should say to these people, let's call your bluff. Because it is a bluff. They're going to stay here. Are this going to move? At the best, they might over three decades decide they're going to move to Switzerland. But they're going to move with a very small number of countries. And your point about uh, China, the whole economic model of the American uh, economy is based on importing goods from China, borrowing the money from China to pay for it. Right? It's completely imp uh, ridiculous. And in the middle of this, because you can't make, uh, there's nothing to do at home, getting involved in financial speculation. Car companies like General Motors getting involved in financial speculation. It was an illusion, this economic boom, and it went bust. Of course, it's predictable. And that's why it's a model we shouldn't follow. And I think you're quite right about that. And we shouldn't be tricked into sustaining. The American model is one where they have got the biggest deficit. And actually, they've always had a deficit. The only thing I'll say about this as well is, is that uh, they still find the money to spend on, on military. Which is a good question. So can we come to another question, please? Go on. You wanted to ask? No, it's fine, please. Go, go sister. Please. I think the, the idea was that we will not increase the tax rates for the richer, the 10% or 1% or whatever they are. I can't off the top of my head remember. And they will the 1%, auto, the 1 <laughs> will automatically pay the tax. Yeah. Well, Vodafone's just not paying their yeah. tax. Tax them, if that yeah. means. I mean, if they're not going to pay it, then tax them. In an equitable It's not system. as simple as saying to Vodafone, you must pay the tax. No, but it's at the end of the day, change the law. And, he going on and David corruption. Cameron won't change the law because his friends will have to start paying tax as well. Yeah. And the bank managers well, will have to pay, and the chief executives will have to pay taxes. So the idea is we have to tax the wealthy slightly more, not maybe 80% at the times before, 30 years ago, but a reasonable equitable amount of tax paid by the rich to invest in the economy, which generates proper jobs with living wage jobs, you know, uh, where people can sustain. And we have the mother of all benefit reforms coming at the moment, which is going to target the most vulnerable in society. Mm. They will be more poorer than they are already the rich are going to get richer, they're going to get poorer, they're going to be homeless, they're going to be destitute. Can I, can I just tell you that uh, what you're saying is quite right, and that's why we must protect our foreign investors, because without our foreign investors, how are we going to pay for these tax reforms? And what exactly is the owner of the Shard building have empathy with, uh, with Britain? Do you think he's here for us? He's not here for us. Well, I mean, He's there for himself. To, to be blunt, He's, Britain is a political union. It's we not need a country, for, I'm not really. denying that we don't need forest, foreign investment. But at the end of the day, foreign investors need to know that they have to invest back into the country. We can't all just avoid the tax and if not if I, yeah, avoid the taxes. Rich people can afford to get rich accountants to draw up their plans. And they will go away. I don't mind paying my dues. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you'll pay your tax, that's fine. And I pay a lot more you tax. You will pay your tax. Because if you take because the poor you have person... to pay your tax. No, no, if a poor person goes to the shop, he has to pay 20% VAT. That's true. 21%. 21% 20 to a rich man is nothing. Absolutely. If, you put, if he has to fork out £100 from his pocket, it's nothing. Somebody that is on job seekers allowance at £71 a week has to go and look for a job and go to interviews. Out of that 671 pounds, if they have to buy a rail card for 15 pounds a day to travel to that interview, how but much this, has that person got left? This is the I'm making, that in order to pay those benefits, we have to have money. Absolutely. Where is the money going to come from? Tax 
the rich. Yeah, tax the rich. Equitably. I'm not tax even talking the about. Got the money. I'm not even talking about taxing them 80 percent, 90 percent over the. You're the talking network. about taxing the people that have got the money. But, but if they're they not then investing. don't have the money, when then they, how are we going to pay for David the David Cameron didn't increase the tax rate. How much have they invested? Where is the investment if they were going to invest? Two years on, we haven't got any investment. Yes, so where is the investment? The, 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 you did, sorry, you did argue that yeah. um, uh, uh, because it, it doesn't tax the wealth tax. Therefore, they are going to reinvest. The question is, um, what is the evidence uh, that, I mean, Cameron has not increased the wealth tax. Yeah. What is the evidence that the wealth, wealthy people have reinvested in the country? Well, we're, lose, we're losing a lot of people who would invest in our country because of taxes. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons that um, in, the, in the April budget... Uh, oh yeah, how, 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 how come we are losing? Because, I mean, we've got the lowest um, income tax rate. The wealthy yeah. are not taxed as much as they should taxes, be. Yeah. So why is it that uh, we are losing out? Well, it's because there are many people that come to this country to invest in hedge funds, to invest in a variety of uh, different uh, industries and products, but they're not seeing the return that they would want to see. They'd rather invest elsewhere. Yeah. But that's why we've got to attract them here. Sorry, we are just that's, repeating that's the same why, arguments. That's why we've got to make it more attractive for them to come here. So, so we are just repeating the whole thing again. Yes. I think. Uh, so another question at the back. No, I have nothing to say. Um, yes, people uh, have not left. So he was on the tax, yeah. Uh, yes. People like HSBC have been threatening, we will go. But we say, go to Hong Kong, go. Yeah. They have not gone. Barclays were threatening, they didn't go. Avon Benfield, which is one of the biggest insurance Well, there's a problem with HSBC. Has actually, no, relocated. It's because they're a British bank. If they go to Hong Kong, they're not a Hong Kong no. bank. Well, they have a Hong Kong It bank. is Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. No, they're registered in the UK. They shifted from Hong Kong to UK after we no. decided to Originally, give Hong Kong back. Originally, it was the yeah. Midland Bank. No, 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 they, they changed bought the name. Midland. Yeah. They bought Midland. Yeah. They bought crazy. Midland. But they retained the name Midland Bank because yeah. the Midland was a UK bank. Yeah, but now, uh, you see, they originated at Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, HSBC, mm. in Hong Kong. When we decided to give Hong Kong back to China, they relocated to London and they bought Midland Bank, okay? Recently, they have been threatening that we will relocate to Hong Kong because most of our business is in Asia. And... Now they found that this is like crying wolf, shut up. Barclays did the same. Other big major corporations are relocating here from global headquarters. People do not relocate to countries. I mean, can you operate a manufacturing operation in Switzerland? You can't. It is a small, tiny country. There is no you market. Could. You could. See, very small. And people relocate because of rule of law because of all kinds of other facilities, because of all kinds of other critical input industries, which we have got. So I think this kind of scaremongering that rich people will go, if the hedge fund managers go, let them go. Because as Lord Turner says, most of their activity is socially useless. This is the head of the FSA. It's not somebody who is in, uh, against them. Okay. Can I just ask a question to Chris? No, no, um, no. Uh, um, you're talking about levying a wealth tax. I was just wondering what kind of um, what kind of shape and form it would take. Um, and arguably, we do have wealth taxes. Anything that's not an income tax is arguably a wealth tax. So, what what what? How would be how would this be different? Would it just be an increase in these rates, or would it be a different type of tax? The simplest way would be actually to increase income tax, even to the level it was under Margaret Thatcher. Income tax is a relative, relatively progressive tax. What we've seen is, as the sister who mentioned it earlier, is in the last three decades, is an increase in, firstly, indirect taxation, and you're quite right in that. Things like VAT increases hit the poorest harder because we pay more for heating, uh, in terms of our budget, food, in terms of our budget than rich people. Um, 
And we've also seen, yeah, and we've also seen things like an increase in national insurance contributions, which actually hit again us much more. I mean, as people who work no, uh, normal working people, the income tax is there to uh, to pay off, and it was introduced to pay off debt at the time of the Napoleonic uh, Napoleonic War. Incidentally, can I just say something about debt while I'm here? We should remember that at a time when, for instance, the discussion about lack of homes in Britain, in 1945, Britain was bankrupt. And yet it went on to build the biggest po uh, uh, housing program ever in our history and a welfare state. These are technical terms. They're not realities. We should remember all of this in one way is a fiction. Money is a creation. It's not a thing, right? You know, what does it mean in terms of balance sheet? I'm sorry if there's an accountant in the room, but what does it mean? It's a social construction. At that time, a government took the decision that despite the dire economic conditions after the Second World War, we would do something for our people. Why not now? Any other questions? I think you'll see also that the impact is coming on regressive taxation. Yeah. Uh, from zero VAT, I think about 30 years ago, really. No VAT. No VAT, yes, to 20% VAT. And I can tell you that by the end of this decade, we will be on 25% VAT, just because we don't want to tax the other side. VAT is the easiest to collect. It hits the people who cannot protest, and it leaves those people who are scheming free because it's a spending tax. This kind of regressive taxation to this level, which is now providing about half our revenue, that is at the bottom of the problem which we have. Um, uh, Chris, so uh, when you're saying that we should tax people more, uh, who are you uh, um, aiming at? Well, well, where else would you draw the line? Simple, like the, the coalition simple, government has allowed up to ten thousand pounds, no point. tax. So would you increase the threshold to say fifteen thousand oh, pounds, and then tax the richer and the richer? So where, how would you have the? Well, for tax? instance, in the last budget, which hit all of us very hard, they actually cut corporation tax and cut tax for the very rich. It's an incredibly incredible situation. People in this really important for a corporation tax, uh, it helps uh, even smaller businesses, not just the rich ones. No, it doesn't affect smaller businesses. It's, this is about big business in terms of its impact. And the real question is what they are doing is, is they, are uh, they are literally driving down living standards for the majority of the population directly through things like VAT increases, and the brother is quite right, indirectly by things like making us work longer, increasing the retirement age to 67. They are actually squeezing more out of us, if you like, at the same time, they're reducing wages, which have reduced, have fallen. Living standards are falling in this country as a result of wage freezes, wage cuts, changes in, the, uh, in labor conditions. I would do, say this quite crudely. If you want to measure it, there has been an increase in the rate of exploitation in the last five, six years as a result of this crisis. And I, for one, know, and for people with long memories, actually work is much harder and much nastier than it was three decades ago when I first mentioned the, the job market. You work longer and just things like amount of unpaid work, unpaid overtime, lack of holidays, you know, and we should talk about this. I understand that, but you still not answer the question. Yeah. How are you going to um, have the, income yeah, but income tax, uh, at what gradation? So how, how much the, the richer, let's say 45 pence to a pound now? Yeah. So you would increase to what? The, the receipts for what it was under Margaret Thatcher, very simply. Which is so insane. Margaret Thatcher was better then? Yeah, Margaret Thatcher actually did so, not... So actually, be, uh, even though you criticised her, she was real. much better than now. Margaret Thatcher didn't introduce, uh, decrease living standards, despite, uh, despite one of the myths about it. Uh, there was huge social problems, don't get me wrong. Huge social problems. The real damage was done, believe it or not, under the new Labour government. That was, and there are many things I think we should talk about this. It was under Tony Blair in particular. And that was where the real celebration of wealth came in. And that's also, I think, if you look back at the embarrassment of it, which is now coming to haunt them, it wasn't just Tony Blair and George W. Bush. It was Tony Blair and Tony Blair. It was the city of London and Gordon Brown. That was when they were really holding up and saying, These, this is what you should be like. This is what you should emulate. You know, in term, uh, terms of it. And I think we should look back and be embarrassed. They should be embarrassed about this, but Tony Blair is not embarrassed about it. Yeah. Can you hold on? The effect hasn't even been incremental over time, so the damage done by yeah. in the Thatcher years has only increased yeah. over the Blair years because effectively the economic policies. Yes. Um, and, and so whilst the Thatcher years um, show for very little lesser damage than the Blair years, they laid the foundations of the, Bla the Blair damage yeah. as well. Yeah, that's right. Sure.
So what, what do you think of the mention tax? And um, uh, I mean, even though it, it was brought by uh, Nick Clegg, uh, at both the shadow um, um, chancellor also has is supporting that and, and saying to Prince Cable, let's get together and instead of using that uh, to um, to help the economy, let's use that to well, help the in, in NHS and those kind of more more practical way of. Um, resolving the crisis of NHS, for example. I, I think there's possibilities there. I have to say Ed Bowles also said he'd have to consult with, his, uh, with the corporations, all the rest of it, before any of this could be done. So, and the answer is going to be no, Ed. So he then... Uh, and I'm very cynical about all this because this is conference season. The Lib Dems, the Labour and the Tories are all about to have their annual conference. The uh, mention tax and so on. It's it's it isn't the manifesto. It's so been it's a long nothing, yeah, so it's However, been there. many things were in the Liberal Democrat manifesto. One of them was free education and not introducing fees for students, which they did. Right, so I, I take it all rather cynically. Uh, the Liberal Democrats, I remember, being a party opposed to the war. So you're against the mention tax then? I'm not against it, but I, I'm very cynical about it. Ever, we're ever going to see this, I have to say. So uh, I just think it's, there's a bit of a game. Do you agree with him about um, uh, taxing the wealth now? We have to uh, bring back what Mrs. Thatcher did, I mean, which I'm quite sure you'd have supported. Well, it's, interesting that, uh, the, it's interesting that the uh, Liberal Party have a very old philosophy which... Uh, is to do with, um, um, I made some notes here, I think it's taxing people uh, who work um, and taxing unearned income, but allowing wealth. Um, the, the uh, just, I made some notes here, just a second. Um, there's a difference between the Liberal Party and their attitude toward the individual and the Conservative Party and their attitude toward the individual. With the Liberal Party, they think that if you work hard, you should just pay a reasonable tax. Um, but if you make a lot of money, and you invest that money, and you make money out of it uh, through in, in investing it and reinvesting it, and you make money without doing anything, that's unearned interest. That's unearned income. And that should be clobbered by the Liberal Democrats, whereas the Conservatives don't see it that way. They believe that if you've worked hard all your life, if you've worked hard all your life, you should enjoy the benefits of your income. So there's a, a, a major difference between the attitudes and the philosophies of the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives. I don't think... Uh, it comes out in tax. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. I think this uh, investment income surcharge was also introduced by Labour Party in the 70s, 15% at that time, on unearned income. Now, having said that, I think when you say Vodafone is not paying their tax and they're threatening, have, if I, a humble taxpayer, refuses to pay tax, I would go into prison. That's correct. Okay. So why can't they put the CEO or the managing director of Vodafone into prison or force them? If you had some um, heavy club, so to speak, and the tax man knocked at your door and you said, if you try to take tax off of me, I'm going to club the Indian revenue over the head with this so that you will not only be able to not take tax off of me, you won't be able to be able to take, ta be able to take tax off of anyone. He would say, OK, sir, I'll leave you alone. Right. And that's exactly what Vodafone have done to the British government. But I think even Vodafone and Goldman Sachs also played some other role at the time. So yeah, these and, are, Goldman Sachs and Goldman well. Sachs. Also. So these, these people are bullying us, in other words. They are bullies. They're bullying the governments and their decision makers. They're actually the criminals. But I, I think the brother has a good point when you say if you did that, you go to jail. If you fiddled your expenses, you would go to jail. George Osborne fiddled his expenses. <laughs> uh, I mean, hundreds of them fiddled their expenses and they've not gone to jail. Uh, if you did some of the things that those bankers did in your job, you'd be sacked. None of them got sacked. So it's like there's two systems here. There's one life for them and... If we did any of the half those things, I'm not saying those things, we'd be out of a job or we'd be in prison. And it does seem like, and I hate to say it's a cliche, it does seem like there's one law for the rich and one law for the poor, one law for the very rich. I think that's true. Okay. But Edwin, do you not think that our system here, taxation system, we, I'm not against people, rich people coming and investing in this country, mm. but they end up paying little or no tax at all? Well, when you say little or no tax at all, if they're going to bring, say, so for £50 example, billion pounds to your country and just pay, say, 1% of that in tax, how much is that? F 500 million, 500... Is that no tax? No, but... Uh, but, but that's not... 
That's not equitable in such way. No, I'm not going to say it because it sounds rude. <laughs> but basically, or oh, somebody's paying me, so I'll let them get away with it. If the poor man on benefits f fraudulently claims welfare benefits, yeah. gets reprimanded, and you might think I'm going on about benefits because I'm a welfare benefit advisor and I work with people. And these are the people that I see that are going to suffer in the next coming A right thing benefited. So that's what I'm saying is... If they are saying we're bringing 50 billion, we're not paying tax, there has to be a negotiation, a compromise. You come to some figure that is equitable, proportionate to what they They can't be making the most of the money, getting away with it, and the rest of us, how horrible. We're in trouble. Now you have to bail us out. Then the government gave them all this money. The small businessman goes to the bank manager, I have a small business. No, 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 your business plan doesn't sound right. We can't do this, this, that, the other. So what is the solution? Wealth tax. Tax the bank managers, the people that have earned loads of bonuses, and make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. Well, what you say is quite right. There should be some sort of proportionality. But what Chris said is the point. There's two laws in operation. There's one for the rich and one for the poor. Really and truly, there really is. Because, because Sorry, sir, I think maybe it's the definition of wealth tax. So he, uh, you, um, I, think, I, I don't think you believe that wealth tax, I mean, what uh, the uh, Vodafone is about a wealth tax, then. Yeah. Is it? Well, the thing is that, you know... No, sorry, it's Vodafone issue, yes. but wealth tax. It could be, but how do you collect it? How do you collect the tax? If they refuse to pay and they threaten to leave, and they have got friends that would also leave as well. If you did, if you went into Vodafone's offices and seized all their computers, right, you'd get your one billion in tax arrears plus, you know, ten percent interest per annum for however long they haven't paid it. But the next day, twenty or thirty other big companies would close down and leave. Mm. Mm. Uh, it is to close a business down. And move relocation costs, redundancy yeah. payments, this, that, the other. Of course, they'll have the smart lawyers that says, you call yourself bankrupt or whatever, whatever, do something, and the rest of us will end up paying their bank in redundancy pays. Because ultimately, the state has a responsibility if the company doesn't have the funds. Yeah? But so do you know how long it takes to shift one billion pounds from one bank account to another? If you're a Muslim, never. But <laughs> that's besides the point. But what I'm saying is, you, if the government can't do these things, then as a people, as a society, we have to bring those changes. We have to lo lobby the parliament. We have to lobby government. We have to put pressure. And I'm sure, I mean, we did at one stage when there was a huge public outcry about the bankers introduce a temporary tax on their bonuses, didn't we? If I'm not mistaken, we did have a small... Tax. So we can do it. it, it there, there has to be a will to do it. Yes, but you can't impose it on big companies. That's why there's know. one law for the rich yeah. and one for the poor. To change the law and okay. make it work. Uh, yeah. I, think, I think all your arguments are premised on the fact, on something that's morally... Show the microphone. Switched on. Um, I think your kind of position is based on a, fund a fundamentally um, morally ambiguous kind of principle and I think the kind of the main point is that if it's wrong it doesn't matter what the consequences are our kind of fundamental mm. principles as a country or as a people should override we can't just start to be utilitarians and think about all the consequences we have to think about our our, our overarching principles and those are overarching principles are if someone breaks the law or if someone has to do something then they should bear the consequences of it and we shouldn't cover up for them. And I think that's what we need to be starting to implement, as opposed to trying to think of the consequences and then think, oh, no, sorry, the consequences are too dire. We must try and, like, get around them. So about yeah, I think that you have to, like, to ask yourself this question. Is it morally right or morally wrong to have money? And is it morally right or morally, morally wrong not to have money? 
I think that's not the question, though. The question no. is, in, in, in a lot of situations, like, for example, with Vodafone not paying their taxes, the question is not whether it's right for them to... Ha it is morally wrong for them to have that money because that money doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the taxmen and the ta yeah, but tax it's not taxpayers, true. right? It's not true. Why is that not true? Because tax is an invented thing. We it is an invented... We introduced inland <laughs> revenue <laughs> tax... Uh, that's fine. ...for the Napoleonic Wars. That's fine, but... And we never stopped it. But having established themselves in this country... So it's morally wrong to tax. It, no, it's not morally wrong. They've agreed to be taxed by establishing themselves in this country. They've agreed to bind themselves to that system. All right, listen, look. The Liberal Democrats Party have got, like, a, an approach to taxation which involves... Uh, which involves trying to shift the burden of tax away from the individual and on to corporates and wealthy people. And you know what? I think that's the correct way of doing it because in the 21st century, that's the Chinese way. What do you think of that? Uh, I think the sister is right. I think you have to start from a moral premise. I mean, as, as I understand it, in, in Islam, if you ha the moral obligation is if you have money, and what, that you should use that money to help in the form of charity and elsewhere. And I think you look at this country, and I think you have to say that you know, millions of pounds is raised for charity. Who is it that donates to charity? And actually, you look at the research into it. It is not the rich. It is overwhelming people who do push hospital beds around, uh, who give money during Ramadan, etc. Right? So, and I think there is a moral quest, uh, question, and I think that's a starting point. The second question I just want to raise is, why would you invest in this country? There are actually people who are investing in this country. Japanese and German car companies invest in this country big time. Right? And they're doing so on a, on a basis, and their calculation is not the tax rate they might have to pay if one of their executives comes and lives in uh, Newcastle. They do it on the basis of productivity, profit, the return they'll get, the skills of the workforce, the fact there's very few strikes in Britain, you know, uh, as a result of what happened in the last uh, three, uh, three decades, and they come here and they invest. And actually, the calculation of individual tax rates doesn't come into it because they, they look at that, uh, which is why people invest in countries with much higher rates of tax, like Sweden and Germany, I mentioned, and, and, and the Nordic model. The third thing I'd like to mention is what you mentioned benefits. Uh, George Osborne got booed at the Paralympic Games. Uh, when he was, uh, th was there. And that was because he is cutting benefits for the disabled big time in a really brutal way, actually. A 20-minute interview less by someone who's not professionally qualified gets you off incapacity benefits. And it's been done on a mass industrial scale in terms of it. It's very easy, I think, for people to think and fall for the sort of Daily Mail line that uh, people in benefits are just feckless and all the rest of it. But I think if you're on a job, there's a reason why you should be concerned about the tax and benefits. The people who pioneered this it were in Germany over 10 years ago. And what a German government discovered is if you cut benefits sufficiently and you ensure there is, people are worried there is no safety net in society, those who are in the job will hang on to that job out of desperation because they are fearful that actually if they lose their job, there is no rescue at all. Chris, and the effect in Germany was to point. cut wages in the 2000s, which is actually why Germany is substantially better in many ways, is through wage cuts. And the tax and benefits actually lead to a tax on, our, on, uh, on wages in this country, and that's been proven. And that's why I think they're so keen on it, by the way. Yeah, yeah Chris, you're missing a very important point. Uh, the reason that George Osborne is cutting disabled benefits is because there's no money to pay something. Well, there is money for many things. There's money to replace Trident nuclear missiles. There's money for a war in Libya and Afghanistan. There seems to be money for lots of things. There's money for mm. Princess, uh, Prince Harry and uh, the rest of his family for the Jubilee. We paid for that. You know? So we, are we, you suggesting we well, should just I find scrap all weapons? Uh, no, I'm not, I, well, let's give you another thing. I'm, I, there was money to pay for the Olympic Games. I'm sure we were welcome, but I mean, it was interesting. The money was there. You know, and there's not an argument about that. Uh, yeah, so when, money when to pay for the Paralympic th Games, Maybe good too. things and bad things, but there's money for plenty of things when they want to do it. There's money to build two big new, uh, aircraft carriers, which have been built. Inter interestingly, these are big aircraft carriers like World War II. The only possible use is to fight a war with China or Russia or America, which isn't going to happen. This isn't for fighting Osama bin Laden. You know, we're building huge um, um, aircraft carriers. Why? And why do we want to replace Trident nuclear missiles? We're watching Iran. They shouldn't have nuclear, uh, nuclear power, nuclear missiles. And yet we're going to spend billions in replacing our nuclear deterrent. You know, allied to the only country in the world that's ever used nuclear weapons, by the way. You know, and then Britain, America is going around the world lecturing other people. Sorry, I'm off subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks.
Yeah. Okay, I think uh, probably to take a more strategic view on it, we go back to the last recession, the 30s, the big one, right? And after that, there were these kinds of arguments and uh, during the war, we tried all those things, nothing was working, but there was a war economy, so it was there. After that, we discovered that, look, there are two options out of this. Either we become communists, which was the main danger, or we establish a welfare state. And fortunately, we opted for the better option, okay? The welfare state obviously meant a lot of compromises by a lot of people and a lot of vested interests and so on. Just look at the NHS. We, to get the consultants on board, we had to make a compromise with them that, look, they will do 18 hours for the NHS and the rest of the time we will allow them to do for their own private practice, which was fine. As a result, we got on board all the consultants and the NHS started to work. Similarly, in all other areas. So now this is a time again where we are at our wit's end. Yeah? These bankers have destroyed 10 years of our growth and the next 10 years there's going to be no growth. 20 years, which means half a lifetime, is gone. We are faced with the same situation do we want a coherent society which has a shared interest in fair, progressive taxation? Not exorbitant taxation, fair and progressive. We've lost that balance, we need to recreate that. If we recreate that balance, and there are many issues, you both of you have highlighted many on either side, pluses and minuses, then we can go forward with a 21st century version of what happened in 1945. Uh, I don't see yet a... a Could I interrupt a, you for a second? Yeah. There? Because you were talking about a co coherent society. Um, there we have the devils in the detail, you see, because we have either a fairer society or a coherent society. Which would you prefer? You see, uh, the two are linked to some extent because... Unless you want to live in... Gated. No, they're not linked. No, because unless one you want wants to a wealth tax and one doesn't. No, it, wealth tax is one <laughs> of the ways. Yeah, it's not the only way of creating that. Wealth tax, because we could see, actually, from the way the poll tax was introduced, that it was ridiculously regressive. Yeah. And everybody in Britain could feel that there is something wrong with that. And uh, thank God that government lost its bearings because of that. After that, what replaced it is not that different. Because once you reach about half a million pounds, I think, you don't pay any more mm, yeah. council tax. It's the same. Whether it's half a million or five million or 10 million, your house is worth, right? Again, people feel that this is somehow not fair, right? So something has to be done. And that's where most people's idea of wealth tax is, yeah? No. It's not... You see, the, the, the argument is, do we have a, a wealth tax and the Liberal Democrats talk about a, a more coherent society, and the Conservatives talk more about a fairer society. The, only now, the Conservatives <laughs> are not in favour of a wealth tax, but the Liberal Democrats are. So the, the detail of that word, coherent and fair, is really important. It's not much of a muchness. It's chalk and cheese. Of course it is, but uh, you know, when a conservative says, I want a fairer society, then uh, one has to wonder whether we want to change the word fair to something else. <laughs> well, I'm talking about the word as it stands, and coherent and fair as they are, not what they could be or what they might be, but what they're actually being stated as today, now. Okay, so coming back, party. as it is, to now create a new compact, if you like, yeah? Whether for fair, equitable, coherent, doesn't matter. But we it have does to matter, that's what I'm saying uh, to No, you. no, no. Uh, but in this context, what I'm saying, it doesn't matter. Because <laughs> what you want to do is to take on board the changes in the labor market and in Britain itself. Britain no longer is a manufacturing economy, per se. It has got a lot of other things. It is a manufacturing economy, but for other countries. Uh, no, the, the share of manufacturing itself has gone down for here or other countries altogether. So we have to figure out how we to create down. that kind of fairness or, you know, uh, equitable distribution 
in a largely service-led economy, which is very much uh, more susceptible to rent-seeking. And to control rent-seeking, this is our problem. Uh, we had learned how to control production, but to control rent-seeking is going to be very difficult. Um, just a quick question. Um, would you want any kinds of wealth tax? I mean, um, do you agree that um, if you want um, earn more money, you should pay more tax? Or you believe that everyone should pay the same tax? Okay. Just uh, um, I think there should be uh, a fairer tax. To tax people fairly is a very, very difficult thing to do. Because if you have a lot of money, you want to pay the right amount, the fair amount. You don't want to pay more than you should pay. Which is fair amount. Similarly, if you're a poor person who can't afford to pay much tax, you don't want to pay more than what you're capable of doing. But by the same token, you still have the obligation to pay. My question is, uh, yes. because we're discussing about wealth tax, uh, wealth tax, so would you say if you're earning 15,000 pounds, you don't pay any tax? If, you, uh, pay, uh, if you're earning two million pounds, you pay the same amount of tax as somebody who's uh, earning 20,000 pounds? Well, no, I mean, that's, that's Mrs. Thatcher's poll tax again, isn't it? Um, the Chinese have got it right, in my opinion. What they do is uh, they say, we tax wealth and we tax corporations. We do not tax individuals. Uh, the reason they don't do that is because most Chinese people are very poor and they wouldn't be able to pay anyway. So when they move to the big cities, they find that they're very, very rich very, very quickly because they're not paying income tax. They don't pay national insurance. They just get what they earn. Uh, yes, I, I lived and worked in China, and I did an awful lot of uh, soul-searching trying to get my Chinese boss to introduce a national insurance contribution scheme, uh, which I arranged through a Western insurance company. And it was so cheap. It was very, very cheap, and he refused on principle. But once the Chinese get a, get a grip on what national insurance is and how you can insure your citizens, I think that they'll very quickly get a, uh, uh, make a law to make it uh, uh, a legal requirement of a company. But by the same token, they don't pay tax. Individuals don't pay tax. Why do individuals have to pay tax in this country? Why not uh, wealthy people and corporations? So are you saying that uh, the wealthy people should pay a tax then? Well, it's a wealth tax, right? Yeah, wealthy people should pay a tax, but a fair amount of tax. It's the wealthy people that run the country, so the wealthy people should pay for it. Poor people shouldn't pay anything. Um, would you, uh, both of you, just conclude uh, one minute each? Um, why do you um, uh, would levy a wealth tax and why you are against uh, levying a wealth tax? I think it's about fairness. I think it's about society we want. I think it's about fundamental democracy, and I think there's a de democratic deficit in this country. I think the phrase we used, 1% rules for 99%, maybe that's an exaggeration, but that's the way it feels about it. And fundamentally, I'm going to repeat the point. At the current moment in time, we are paying, we, ordinary working people in this country, are paying a very high price for decisions that are made by bankers and financial speculators which wrecked our economy. We are paying, and they are continuing to party. It's like, you know, they are continuing to celebrate their wealth. They're still going to continue to rake it in. I believe that is morally wrong. And I believe in any society where there is a democracy, there would be a choice about that and it would be, be wrong. And I think, in conclusion, I also think we should be looking at all different alternatives to the current setup. And I think one of the most important things people should be doing is not just enough to talk about a wealth tax, we should be looking at other systems which can possibly provide an answer to this system. Well, I think that uh, the wealthy people uh, and corporates in this country have been paying a disproportionate amount of money in tax for so long. And that's one of the reasons that companies like Goldman Sachs and Vodafone and you know, many others have just decided not to pay tax anymore because they think they've contributed enough and they don't want to pay anymore. So I think that wealthy people and corporates uh, should be taxed reasonably uh, fairly, and I think that at the moment they're overtaxed and they shouldn't be taxed anymore. So now um, I would like, would you like 
would like to vote uh, on this debate. Uh, on the one hand, you have... <laughs> On the one hand, we have um, Chris who says that uh, there should be a, a levy for a wealth tax uh, for the wealthy people. On the other hand, Andrian says, no, they've already paid too much. And there should be uh, no wealth tax. You know, it should be a fair tax. So shall we? Um, fair wealth tax. OK, fair wealth tax. So shall we vote be, for the motion? There's got to be some then? reason why people want to work to earn money, to be rich. Right. We've got to have that incentive there. Mm. Okay. Um, so shall we vote for the um, the motion that uh, this house would lay uh, would levy a wealth tax? No one. Yeah, it's only two people in f uh, favor. Four people. One, two, three, four, <laughs> five, yeah. six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11. 11, 4, and anyone against? <laughs> One against. You are with the rich people, right? Okay, anyone against? <laughs> two. Two against. Three against. Three. Uh, two and a half. <laughs> and uh, the rest are <laughs> abstentions. Abstentions. So um, this house does uh, agree that uh, we should um, levy wealth tax. 